everybody. This is Chris. And Kathy. We wanted to take a minute to thank you all for tuning in. We appreciate every listener and are grateful for this platform. Please help us share our vision by subscribing to our show through your favorite streaming app. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Petability Podcast. Check out our ever-growing list of affiliates and sponsors. Simply go to the show notes for information and links. Proceeds from purchases help to support our show. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simon, Certified Veterinary Technician and Certified Canine Rehabilitation Practitioner. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston, Licensed Physical Therapist and Small Animal Physical Rehabilitationist. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. Good morning, Kathy. What is going on today? Hi, Chris. I'm feeling a little bit nostalgic today with yesterday being Petability's three-year anniversary. Here, here. I know. And I went back in my mind to when we first met and just this really chance encounter when you called and I answered the phone mm-hmm. and, and how far we've come. I just want to let, you know, the audience know at this rear juncture. And this is always how I felt. And my friend Chris is one of the hardest working, most talented CCRPs I know. And honestly, I feel the very same way about our guest today, veterinary neurologist, Dr. Gina Silver, and how fortunate we are to have her in our circle. She's brilliant and so talented. And I'm not just saying that because I have a six-year-old pug and I will likely be in need of her services in the near future, but I had a friend who has since passed away, veterinary surgeon, Dr. Joel Wolfson, and he was a very gifted, very talented veterinary surgeon. And whenever I would refer cases to him, I would have this, just this feeling of relief for the owner and the pet. Joel's got this, and he's going to do his very best to take care of these people and their pets. And I feel the same way about, about Dr. Silver. Whenever she sees one of our clients, I just have such a sense of relief and a sense of relief for the patient and the client because they are in the most capable hands possible. And I'm going to be able to get a good night's sleep because of that. And she's such a wealth of knowledge and a great educator. And that's why we've had her on the show twice before, where we discuss disc disease and this vestibular dysfunction. And those are two of our most popular shows, Chris. So um, if you haven't had a chance to listen to those, go back and listen to those episodes. And so we've invited Dr. Silver back to talk to us today about seizures, what they are, what causes them, and how we treat them. So Kathy, it's it's ironic that you mentioned yesterday was our three-year anniversary. And the first time we had Dr. Silver on our show was indeed on that anniversary three years ago. She was part wow. of four, four podcasts that we launched simultaneously. So it, it's kind of serendipitous, if you will, that, that she would be back three, three years right. later. So just a little um, background on Dr. Silver before we get started. Uh, Dr. Silver earned her veterinary degree from the Atlantic Veterinary College in Prince Edward Island, Canada in 1995. She completed a small animal medicine and surgery internship at Washington State University, where she remained on staff there as a resident for neurology and neurosurgery. And following that residence, she stayed on fa- uh, She stayed on as faculty for one year as a clinical instructor. And Dr. Silver gained board certification in neurology by the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine in the year of 2000. And, and shortly after that, she was practicing at Massachusetts Veterinary Referral Hospital in Woburn, Massachusetts, where she's where she has been since the year 2000. Please welcome Dr. Gina Silver to the show. Show. Hi, Kathy and Chris. Thank you for having me back on your show. And I cannot believe it's been three years. And also the reference to Joel, who is also a, a near and dear friend to me. And I also hold him in the same esteem that you do, Kathy, that just just feels sense of security when Joel's involved. He's one of the first um, surgeons that I met moving to Massachusetts and was an instant friend. And I think we all miss him uh, a lot. Yeah, a special terrible. person. I have um, in kind of a, a personal connection with you, Dr. Silver, because uh, we were colleagues at Mass Vet Referral Hospital at the time that my first cavalier came into my life. And I've told the story before on the show. She came in through the ER and 
she was seven months old. That day she had had seven seizures and was blind. And I had researched a little bit and thought that Cavaliers may be a good match for my lifestyle and so forth. But at the time I, I saw her, I was getting ready to leave, you know, at the end of the night, it was a late night. It was like eight or nine o'clock and, and I'm looking for my assistant to, to tell her goodbye. And she's holding this puppy in her arms and the puppy was out of it. And I don't know if she'd been sedated or, or if it was just, uh, you know, part of, of the whole process. But you know, the bottom line is that that we agreed to sign the dotted line and take her into our care thinking, well, maybe, you know, we can figure out what's going on in terms of these seizures and, and rehome her. But she was very needy and she stole my heart from the very beginning. And you were my neurologist and helped me to navigate through the the entire process. And I never thought that I would ever learn so much about seizures. And in her case, she was diagnosed with idiopathic epilepsy. So after doing a workup, which I'm sure you're going to describe later in the show, you know, that was ultimately her diagnosis. But, you know, we, we had a great uh, seven years together. She had a wonderful life and you were a big part of that. So thanks. Yes. So uh, Chris and I go, go way back and certainly Dagny uh, was a huge part of that. So yeah, seizures are, you know, when you first start out uh, a life with a dog with seizures, it's, it's like drinking from a fire hose. It can be pretty overwhelming, but it changes too over the life of the animal. But you do you do become an expert in knowing your animal and um, you know how to deal when things are, are not going so great. But um, it is a, a, a learning, a steep learning curve, but uh, most people get on board pretty quickly. I remember her general vet saying, I can't believe how you just take this in stride. You know, I, I'd be like, oh, yeah, she had three seizures, you know, last week. And, you know, blah, blah. and she's like, and you're not panic. I'm like, no, we just have our routine and, and do our thing. And I should probably interject in here, too. She'd come in through the ER from her breeder. So I don't know what her backstory was, but she had been worked up somewhat in internal medicine at Mass Vet Referral Hospital, and um, they had ruled out some things, but the breeder just didn't have the bandwidth to continue to financially yeah. sleuth out what was going on, um, as well as probably, you know, the time and, and so forth. So she was looking to surrender this puppy, and, and I gladly uh, took her home. So, Yeah, especially in the beginning, it's, um, you know... It you know, the term epilepsy, it, it's, it, it's not a blanket statement. So you can have some animals that need, you know, very little care, sometimes not even any medications because the seizures are very few and far between, but then you can have some other animals that, you know, it, it, it can escalate to being, um, you know, quality of life, you know, questioning, um, having, you know, four or five different anticonvulsants and still having two to three days of seizures every two to three weeks can get really hard, you know, physically, emotionally, and uh, financially for owners. So epilepsy is definitely a journey. And it's uh, something I would say you have to be fluid and we go with the flow, but you, you start with one foot and, um, you know, you go forward and make decisions based on how your animal's doing. Dr. Silver, can you define what a seizure is for our audience? Yeah, so a seizure is usually a you know a short episode in time where there's abnormal um, hyperelectrical function in the brain, um, and so clinically from the outside, what you may see, what that looks like, it, it can vary. So uh, I'll always say the classic seizure, um, and they don't just because they aren't classic, it doesn't mean it can't be a seizure. But the classic seizure often happens at times of rest. So most of us have our animals in bed with us at night. And so sometimes the owner will wake up to the animal thrashing, paddling, jaw champing, salivating, or frothing at the mouth. Um, if their bladder is full, they often urinate during that episode. It can last anywhere from 30 seconds to two to three minutes. There's usually no warning it's going to happen. It just comes out of nowhere. And there's often what we call a post-ictal or post-seizure phase, uh, where often the animal can be blind. Um, they can be very confused. Sometimes they're hungry. Sometimes they're clingy. Sometimes they're angry. Uh, but there can certainly be a, a phase right afterwards where it takes them a little bit of time to kind of get back to knowing, you know, what the heck just happened. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what a classic seizure looks like. Um, certainly, they don't have to be as as violent as what I just described. And what I'll often tell clients when they come in 
you know, the first part of our exam is if someone comes to me and says, my dog had a seizure, the first thing we go through is describe it for me. Um, there are other things that can look like seizures, sometimes even cardiovascular, sometimes neck pain. Um, so there's different things that can, or vestibular vertigo signs can look like seizures. So the first thing uh, is really getting a good description of what that episode looked like even grabbing a video, which seems so odd when the animal's having this burst of what the heck's going on to grab your phone and video your dog. But that's super helpful for me to kind of decide if we all agree that this is a seizure because our conversation may be very different if we decide it's a heart problem. Um, so the first part is defining what event your dog just had. Um, Dr. Silver, is there a, um, you know, we talked, you just talked about a a post-ictal period after the seizure is there? I think it's called aura. Is that correct? Is there some sense for some of these dogs that their seizure is coming on? I think there probably is in some animals. I don't mm -hmm. think most of us recognize that. So mm -hmm. I would say if, you know, on occasion, I'll have a client that once they get used to um, experiencing seizures with their animals, there's some clients that will say they can tell when it's happening or when it's about to happen, it's mm -hmm. pretty rare. Most of the time it just comes out of nowhere. It's helpful if the owner is like, you know, nine times out of 10, if I see my dog do this, I know within a couple of minutes he's gonna have a seizure. That's actually super helpful because in those cases you can pre-treat. So maybe you give that animal a little bolus of a medication that might help ward off the seizure. Unfortunately, I'd have to say like 99% of my clients, they don't know what's happening until boom, it happens. And I can see where that would be the case because I think in people, your typical auras are maybe an odd smell or, you know, a taste or something like that. And and we would have no way of of knowing that in our, exactly. our pets. Yeah. Exactly. And so there's kind of three phases just to reiterate for our audience here. So you have the pre-ictal or prior to the seizure, which most of the time is not recognized. And then the ictal phase, which is the seizure itself. And then the post-ictal phase, which can be lethargy, restlessness, like you said, the temporary blindness and so forth. So I know with Dagny, for sure, she was the restless. I called it manic. Um, she would pace. She would whine, yip, uh, cry, bark, bark, bark. So it, it took a few years, actually, when, you know, I would be up for hours um, after Dagny had a seizure, because as you said, it was always in bed in the middle of the night. And my partner actually suggested, she's like, don't we have a thunder shirt? And what if we tried putting that on her? Which wasn't always easy because of, you know, her being in an active seizure, but it turned things around 100%. And the fact that during that post-ictal phase, no barking, no pacing. Within minutes, she would just go back to sleep. It was phenomenal. So just a little tip out there for you guys that yeah. uh, might experience that. It could help because that helps to suppress some of the abnormal neurological activity through input with the body. Gentle mm -hmm. squeeze, gentle hug. So anyway. It's a good tidbit, Chris, because I, I do find Again, it's a process and over time you kind of figure out what works for your animal, what little tips and tricks. And one of the things I tell clients when they come in is your dog's epilepsy is your dog's epilepsy. Mm -hmm. And you know, it gets hard to not get online and Facebook in the park and, oh, so-and-so did this for the dog and it worked. And it's just like, <laughs> I've been doing this for over 25 years. And I say, every dog is different. And what one dog responds to does not yes. automatically mean another dog's going to respond to it. And the thunder okay. shirt is is harmless. It's not going to hurt Absolutely. the dog. So it's something that we could try that's not going to be harmful. Absolutely. So how common are seizure disorders? <laughs> that's a great question. Um, so for me, it's, you know, the top, probably the top three things that I see are the things that yeah. we've discussed on your, on these podcasts. So seizures, vestibular dysfunction, and, and back issues from disc disease. So for me as a neurologist, it's one of the top things I see. As far as, you know, percent wise of the general population, I, th I think the number is like five to 10 percent of dogs have seizures. But again, for me as a neurologist, it's one of the top things sure. I see. How about cats? Um, we definitely see seizures in cats as well. I would say um, percent wise, I probably see 65 to 70 percent dogs with the 25 to 30 percent cats. But we do see it in cats as well. 
So could anything that has a brain potentially have a seizure because it's an abnormal electrical activity within the brain? Yes, absolutely. What um, what types of seizures are there? Because you had mentioned that you could have a, you know, a 30 second seizure or you could have a two or three minute seizure. And I know you had said your dog's epilepsy is your dog epi- your dog's epilepsy. I have a patient who has these like facial tick and I've not, not seen that very often, but just the, and that's how they know she's having a seizure. Sure. And maybe I wouldn't have picked up on that, but um, the owners do. So what, what, types of se- what types of seizures are there? Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the classic ones are going to be a grand mal seizure, which is, you know, when they happen at times of rest, the paddling, the frothing, the urination. You can also have smaller seizures, you know, whether you call them petite mal or focal seizures, so smaller forms of seizures that sometimes you'll just see it in one part of the body. So whether it's a side of the nose or the lip that's twitching and drooling, to be honest with you, those ones can be a little more challenging to know what they are because, you know, they're very silent. You might not even see them. They're not as dynamic as a grand mal seizure. You can have some absent seizures where, you know, the animal just spaces out. But again, it's very hard to know what the animal's doing because um, it's not a, a classic seizure. And then with as far as the type of seizures, I think, you know, to take a step back when a client comes in and we determine that, okay, yes, the episode that your animal had does fit with a seizure. The next big discussion is, well, what can cause a seizure? And so it can get a little uh, confusing if you jump on Google, which we all do it, including me, mm-hmm. um, and type in dog seizures, your head's going to spin. So I, I tell people just keep it simple. Three categories of things that we consider when animals have seizures. So there's going to be idiopathic epilepsy, and the idiopathic means we don't know. And so this is a problem at a, a functional level, a neurotransmitter level. So things are misfiring, but we don't know why that's happening. The next cause is going to be metabolic causes. And so I think of that as everything below the head down. So liver, glucose, electrolytes, is there something in the body that's uh, causing the brain to have the seizure? And the last category is going to be structural brain disease. So is there something going on upstairs, be it a stroke, tumor, something inflammatory, encephalitis, a degenerative condition? Um, or even some fun form of a congenital malformation that the animal was born with. So I kind of look at those are kind of the three broad categories. The hard part with epilepsy is there really is no test for it. So it's a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning I've checked all those other possibilities out and we didn't find something. Or I'll often say we'll figure it out in time because with epilepsy, the seizure is mild, severe, you know, or, you know, one a year or, or 500 a year. The big thing with epilepsy is that when the seizure is said and done with, basically the animal comes back to the normal self. So in time, if I have a client that comes in and their animal's been having these seizures for two to three years, but they're otherwise normal, just with that chronicity, likely that's going to be an epileptic animal. Things that are metabolically causing the animal to have a seizure or structurally causing an animal to have a seizure are going to progress over time. So there's going to be other clues that show up at some point. What happens to the brain and the body with these prolonged seizures or cluster seizures or multiple seizures? What's happening to these dogs long-term from this? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, fortunately, the majority of seizures are short. So they're usually under two, three minutes. There's some animals that I will say they're one and done, meaning their their MO is that when they have one, it's just one. There are some other animals that, you know, whether it started out as one and done or, or, or and it progressed or from the get-go, it just started out as multiple. But there's some animals that when they have seizures, they're going to cluster, which usually means that they have more than two seizures in that 12-hour period. So even with those, again, most of the animals are going to come through their seizure, come through their cluster seizures, you know, uh, unscathed. However, seizures can become very dangerous or even life-threatening if they go into a seizure and don't come out, which is called status epilepticus. Or if those cluster seizures start happening really close together and the animal never has a time to recover in between the seizures. These are the ones that can be life-threatening. Fortunately, you know, they're a low percentage of the cases that we end up seeing. Most animals um, were able to don't go into that uh, degree of severity. But as far as the, the life-threatening component to it is, you know, when they're when the body's going through such a strenuous uh, tonic-clonic convulsions, 
their body temperature goes up. And so if we have a, an animal where we're going to get into trouble is, you know, the owner will say, gosh, you know, my dog started having a seizure. It didn't stop. It's been going on for 15 minutes. We figured we needed to come to the ER. We live an hour away. So if that animal comes into the hospital and they're still in the midst of having a seizure, the concern with that dog is his body core temperature is going to be so elevated, it may not even register on a thermometer. So those dogs, we do start worrying that they can die from that, um, almost like having heat stroke or being locked in a car on a hot sunny day. So the, you know, the damage to the body and the brain is overheating. This is fascinating. Dr. Silver, do you remember Darlene and Ruby? And I think you were the, her neur neurologist, but I'm, I'm not actually positive. And uh, that was the case. The, uh, Ruby was a border collie and she had a prolonged seizure because she was being boarded and the um, kennel didn't act quickly enough. Mm -hmm. And so unfortunately, she ended up quadriplegic. Her brain seemed okay. I mean, she was oh, very... Yes, Chris, I do remember this case. Yeah, very yeah. responsive and, and so forth. And and I know they got like an Eddie's Wheels cart and things yeah. like that really hit home, you know, like having my experiences with Dagny and then hearing Darlene's story with Ruby, I was like, wow, that's just yeah. really sad. And I would say that that experience, like that, even for me in 25 years, like that's, that's a very unique situation because most of the dogs that have that degree of trauma from going into status, they usually don't survive that. And so I have seen very few clients that have had their dog come through that and be so and left with such severe deficits. Um, and that mom was fantastic and just mm -hmm. do everything for her dog. So that's a very that's a very unique situation. So most dogs don't re don't recover from that. Or you could also say maybe animals that are in that situation, most owners don't continue on and and have the animal put to sleep. Yeah, it's one of the other. It's hard part with that uh, Ruby. I'm not sure if she had a history of seizure beforehand, but one of the things our clients will say is. You know, they have a hard time finding someone to take care of their animal, whether it's for daycare or boarding, because the animal has seizures. And, um, you know, for liability from the boarding facility, you can kind of see that, you know, if they don't have somebody there 24-7, um, it's a liability for them to take on that responsibility in case um, a seizure happens when nobody's around. Mm. So it's uh, often we'll have clients say that, you know, gosh, what what do I do? when I need to go out of town. And I think it's always best if you can find someone who comes <clears throat> and lives at the house, or unfortunately, it should be at a vet hospital where there's 24-hour care, um, which can get very expensive. Yeah. In my case, we had someone who had a very small boarding facility within her home. And so that was good. You know, Dagny was very comfortable there. She did have um, some seizures one time. And Sue rightfully, you know, took her to Mass Vet, you know, just because she wanted to err on the side of caution and, and Dagny checked out just fine. But yeah, we were fortunate to have someone like that that was willing to, to take her on. Now, most of the time, you know, I remember earlier in the podcast, you said it happens during a period of rest and, you know, mm -hmm. at that time. And I'd read online, like from midnight to 5 a.m., you know, it was the most common mm -hmm. time. But I did notice, and I don't know if you'd call this a trigger or or what it would be, but often she would be fine during her stays with Sue, but mm -hmm. almost 100% predictably, she would then have seizure events when she got home. Oh, that's so, interesting. Yeah. So I don't know if, you know, kind of the stress and, yeah, sure. you know, whatever, being in a different environment kind of kept them at bay. Yeah. And then when she was able to come home and relax, she would often have at least one and more typically two or three, you know, like that following week. Yeah. Well, and that's, again, over time, you've kind of realized, you know, her little tricks and tips uh, of what's going to happen, some things that you can predict. But uh, stress, you know, absolutely in people, stress is a huge trigger. So I'd worked with a resident once, and I always find it kind of fascinating when I'm when I know somebody who has seizures because I'm all like, okay, what drugs do you use? How do you feel? What are you seeing? And you know, she would have some of these absent seizures where she was having seizures you couldn't see from the outside, but she could tell you she was having them. Wow, um, it was pretty debilitating for her. But 
you know, she definitely said that stress, anxiety, lack of sleep, poor diet, um, you know, those things could be triggers for her. And those are things we don't appreciate as much in animals because they don't talk. Now, one thing I will say, I do have, you know, I've certainly have come across animals that the only time they have a seizure is either going to the vet or going to the groomer. No other time, mm -hmm. just those mm -hmm. times. And I'm like, well, bonus, that's that's easy. Uh, so you just yeah, avoid, avoid it. <laughs> you pre-treat them so that the anxiety is ah. not there. And I had one dog who's the, you know, a long-term client of fa fabulous clients. Uh, every time mom, she traveled a lot for work, but every time the dog saw the suitcases coming out, <laughs> so, mm -hmm. stressful enough that they're going to have a rough couple of days. I guess one of my questions too is, you know, you talked about some differentials and things, but how would an owner know between like muscles twitching, shivering, tremoring, dreaming, you know, dreaming, and, you know, that sort of thing and an actual seizure? Yeah. Some things you can do because, you know, again, I get a lot of videos which are so helpful. I love videos. Some of them to me are kind of funny, but... uh <laughs> Because so I'll get videos of the dogs in REM sleep, you know, running and barking in their sleep. Yeah. So one thing is if you touch the dog or stimulate the dog and they wake up and it stops, it's not a seizure. So you can't stop a seizure by touching, grabbing your attention, making them stand up and walk. If the twitching, the tremoring, if that stuff's stopping with visual or physical, you know, stimulation of the animal, that's not a seizure because a seizure is going to come do its thing and finish when it's going to finish. So those would be some little tricks that they can do. Yeah. I, I read somewhere about like, if you can get their attention, if they seem to be aware of their surroundings and things. And conversely, I had a client whose dog, she'd bring him to the office uh, with her. He's a pit bull. And he was literally standing at her desk and he kind of like wobbled a little bit, but mm -hmm. he remained standing mm -hmm. and he was just blank. And no matter yeah. what she did, like, you know, DJ, DJ, whoa, hello. And he he didn't come out of it for, you know, like you said, 30 seconds or a minute or something. Yeah. And those ones, to be honest with you, are always a little more challenging. So what I'll say with an owner when they describe the episode or show me a video of the episode, if it's not a classic seizure, I just tell them it doesn't mean it can't be a seizure. It just means it opens the door to other things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you just, sometimes it's a process, it's time. So you know, if these little events are happening, you know, once, twice, three times, five times a year, but they're really spread out, we're probably not going to do much about them. Um, you know, physical exam, probably basic lab work. Sometimes as time goes on, either things work themselves out and they stop or they become more apparent as to what's causing it, meaning that there's more clues. So, you know, an office call, sometimes you don't leave with, you know, everything wrapped up in a little bow that you've got an answer and how you're going to fix it. Sometimes it's uh, an introduction and a baseline um, and it's an ongoing relationship. So uh, sometimes I'll tell clients, this isn't the buy out the door, you're done. This is let's see what happens over the next little bit. And, and uh, the truth will out itself eventually. Um, and sometimes if their episodes are happening frequently enough, sometimes we try um, trials of anticonvulsants to see if they're helpful. But when we do that, the episodes have to be happening frequently enough that we can make, you know, an evaluation of if the drug helped. Um, so if they're happening, you know, every every third month um, and I start a medication trial, it's going to be really hard to know, you know, if, if it's just not happening enough for me to kind of evaluate whether the medication's helping or not at all. Is surgery an option for some of these dogs? Um, so certainly in people, they try to you know, pinpoint the seizure focus and do surgery. We're not there in veterinary medicine. Mm -hmm. um, at one point where I had started at Washington State University way back when, my mentor had been doing, uh, had been doing before I got there, because they had stopped is, you know, if seizures start on one side of the brain, they could spread to the other side. So they're transecting the, the connections between the two uh, cerebral hemispheres. They stopped doing that. So we do, we do not have a surgical approach for seizures, or sh sh I should say, we do not have a surgical approach for epilepsy at this point in time in animals. Now, the other thing that we'll get to, we're talking a lot about epilepsy, which is, again, just animals have seizures and there's no pathology that we can determine that's causing it. Certainly, we see lots of animals that have pathology um, that's causing their seizures. And so in those cases, if you can address the pathology that's causing the seizure, sometimes that can be a uh, uh, help to reduce the seizure numbers. 
so such as like uh, a lesion on the brain, or maybe lesion a on the brain. brain. Yeah. So whether it's uh, you know congenital malformation hydrocephalus, they can consider putting a shunt in. If it's a tumor that's surgically resectable or radiation therapy, um, if we can shrink or minimize or reduce the volume of the mass that's causing the seizure, that can help with seizure frequency. Encephalitis. We've got medications for encephalitis. If we're able to resolve the encephalitis, that can resolve the seizures. So it, it kind of depends on what's causing it. There are some, you know, metabolic causes. So, you know, a classic metabolic cause would be an animal who's a diabetic and either doesn't eat or gets too much insulin and the glucose levels drop. So again, adjusting what caused the seizure uh, can help prevent them going forward. Are you seeing one breed represented more than another? Uh, so for me, when it's such a common thing that I see, it's not that I'm like, you know, oh, this breed gets seizures. Certainly there are breed, pre breed predispositions, but I see seizures in every size, shape, breed, and combination. Um, I do think that there's some breeds that when they come in with seizures, I think that they can be more challenging to um, treat. They can be sometimes a little harder epileptics and not as uh, responsive to some medications. So in my hands, um, you know, border collies, um, Australian shepherds, I, those the, those two breeds in particular, I find can be when I when I first meet them in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, this might be might be more of a challenging case. But you know, again, time time will tell. We st we start uh, as I said, one foot in front of the other. So we always start with the same um, kind of start starting line. That if uh, the client's having more than one seizure for three months on a consistent basis, and I say three strikes you're out, then we usually discuss starting an anticonvulsant. And so when we start an anticonvulsant, there's kind of four cornerstones of drugs that we can pick from, and we'll make a decision based on who's in front of us. So if things are kind of not so bad, but it's you know time to start something, we'll pick something fairly mild, minimal side effects, but um, you know, sometimes when you pick a mild, minimal side effect medication, it's not always the you know, most potent or most reliable medication, but everyone's different. So we just start somewhere. And then I tell clients expectations are not the seizures are going to stop. What we're trying to do is slow the seizures down or just make it better than what you're currently having. And better is relative. So if I have a client whose dog has cluster seizures every two weeks um, and I can get that to every three weeks, that client's thrilled. Vice versa, if you took a, a dog who has a focal seizure every four months and, you know, told them that now they're going to be every two months, that client would be super upset because it's going in the wrong direction. So we just want to make it better than what you currently have. Dis uh, decisions on when do we bump the medication, when do we add other medications, um, you know, it, it's all based on, well, what, what's been happening, um, what happened when we start the medications, do we make an improvement? So say the seizures are coming every four weeks. We started at meds, we got it to every six weeks, and then over six, eight months, all of a sudden they're back to five weeks, four weeks. You know, when things, when the interval between them starts uh, reducing um, time frame wise, that's when we make some adjustments. So there may always be breakthrough seizures, even Absolutely. with medication. Absolutely. Now, there's some dogs that, you know, I start something and the owner's like, we haven't had any seizures since we started medications. And I'm like, hallelujah, buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> um, so I tell those clients that they're, you know, that they're in a uh, percentage that's, they're very fortunate. So that's fantastic. The other hard part is, you know, nobody wants their animal on drugs. And so I have some clients that come in and six months seizure free, they're like, can we get off the drugs? And, you know, it's it's a nice conversation to be able to have, because uh, that means everyone's happy and things are going well. But then the discussion is, don't rock the boat, things are going well, don't mess with what's working. Or we can certainly, you know, start um, a taper and see what happens, understanding we don't know if the dog's not having a seizure because they're not going to have them or the drug's doing what it was supposed to do. So some clients would be like, let's just get off. Other clients are like, we're leaving it. So again, it depends a little bit on which drug they're on, if there's any side effects, how the liver's metabolizing things. Um, but you know, sometimes nobody ever wants to go back to seizures. So sometimes if things are going well, um, you might just leave them leave them where they are for a while. All this discussion is making me realize that Dagny, I hate to keep bringing her up, but from my personal experience, it was she was a difficult case. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. she was. Because we had to add in more medication. Yeah. She did experience the side effects of the medication. She also developed some other comorbidities through the process. So 
Wow. This is enlightening. Yeah. And depending on, you know, the medications, you know, there's, I would say that there's maintenance medications. So those are the drugs that you're going to use, you know, whether it's once a day, twice a day, indefinitely with the hope to increase the time between the seizures. And those are the drugs, I call them the 401k planning, because it's all for planning for the future based on what's happened up, up to date. And so there's kind of four cornerstones that we'll use for that. And again, we make a decision on, do we have to change based on what we've done and what's happening at home? So if seizures are becoming more frequent, we adjust and adjusting is either bumping up or if we've done that, or if we've kind of reached the threshold of where we can push that drug without getting into uh, risking some some more serious side effects, then we add. So the other thing sometimes I have clients say is, you know, can we get off that one and try another one? And Unfortunately, it's it's a process of add, 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 add. If you get to a point where you're like, whew, Shangri-La, things are great, then again, you either don't rock the boat because a lot of these drugs are complementary or they work in a little bit of different way, different ways. So a combination sometimes can be helpful. But then this is also, so if I have a dog on four medications, this is also the important part of talking about, okay, again, Chris, you know your dog best, you know what's worked best for your dog. And so sometimes I'll say to clients, okay, we're on these four medications. In our journey of adding these on, which of these drugs do you think work best? Where, Which drug did you feel like you saw the best response for a period of time? And again, those clients will give me different answers. Sometimes they'll say, well, that drug did great. We put them on this one that didn't do anything. So if in that client's experience with their animal, if they feel, okay, of the drugs I'm on, this is the one I found was the least helpful, then that's the drug that if we're going to start peeling back, that's the drug that we'll pick. So again, it's not a, you know, a format that every animal follows the same. It's based on that animal's experience or that owner's experience. And it is a two-way conversation. I'm in the passenger seat. They're in the driver's seat. It's a conversation. And we make decisions based on that animal. So what do, what should owners do if their pet has a seizure and when should we go to the ER? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question uh, coming off of COVID. So, uh, <laughs> so right, right. You know, the whole industry is just in such a, you know, we're recovering like the rest of the world. Um, and so the hard part with the seizure is the first time you see a seizure, everyone's going to get in the car, run to the ER. Now, there's a reality that once you get there, a lot of ERs are on, you know, shoestring staff and they, they're diverting. So based on the, you know, employment that they have at the time you show up, they may look at your your pet and if the pet is stable, they may send you home and tell you to go see your primary vet or or set you up with a neurology appointment um, the next day. You know, again, it's it's a certainly if you have the opportunity, it's always nice to go in and and see either an ER vet or your primary vet. Again, with epilepsy, by the time you get there, everything's going to be completely normal. But, you know, that's a a whole new event for you guys. So I think it always makes sense to check in with a vet. If you feel at home, it's, you know, three in the morning and like, okay, recovered, everyone's good. I would just call your vet in the morning. If you're concerned, head to the ER. You might want to give them a call before you show up, just in case they tell you that they're not going to let you in. Hopefully things will change. I know at my hospital, I feel like, I feel like we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. It was, but it's been pretty bad the last couple of years. It's been um, not great. You know, pre-COVID days when I had diagnosed, you would you, you, there was a very specific um, criteria. It was like yeah. X number of seizures within, or a seizure that lasts longer than. Can you yeah. state that? Sure. Um, and this is where I tell clients what will send you to the ER when your dog first starts having seizures is very different than after you've lived with it for you know, some period of time. Mm-hmm. So after you've been through a few of them and you're just like, oh, okay, you know what? They're usually two, three minutes and they recover. They're fine. So for that client, what's going to send them to the ER three years down the road is if you know normal. So if all of a sudden you're like, oh crap, this is so much worse than before. This is not normal. That will send you to the ER. In general, when you call an ER hospital, understand you're, you're talking to um, phone center staffing who has general formats to, to give you some information. And I think what a very safe recommendation is, is that if there's been more than three seizures in a 12-hour period, you should head in. Or if your animal's not really recovering from the seizure, you should head in. And so those are kind of, those are, I think, very safe recommendations. 
what I tell my clients is after we've kind of gotten to know each other and you've had um, enough episodes of seizures, I always say it's your comfort level. So are you going to work? Is the animal going to be alone? Do you have your rescue kits at home? So all of my patients, and I'm sure Dagny, had little rescue kits. So the rescue kits um, are either a form of uh, nasal midazolam, so it's an injection of a medication that goes up the nose, or rectal Valium, uh, it's a Valium suppository. So I call those EpiPens for seizures. And so if you have a seizure going on longer than four minutes, or they're starting to happen back to back, or if you're just like, oh my gosh, this is out of control, this is different than what I'm used to, you've got a backup. So you basically give this emergency medication and the spirit of it, it should pull, pull the animal out of the seizure. So you usually have a couple of those on hand at home. And so again, I'll say to my client, do you have your emergency kits? Are you gonna be home for the day? How are you feeling? Do you feel out of control? Is your animal recovering in between? And so we try to empower you at home because the problem is that if you have to go to an ER every time your animal has a seizure, you know, I get asked the question, will my animal die from having a seizure? And, and although they can, more animals will die from physical, emotional, or financial fatigue of clients who are living with animals that are hard to control for seizures. So if you're in the ER every week, every month, it adds up. And so at some point, you have to stop financially. So if we can empower you at home with a little emergency kit, that can save you a couple of trips into the ER, you know, that that may help you long term. And, and there are a couple of things I tell clients to do just in that short term. And the first thing I say is don't panic. Right. Don't don't panic. Try to, to keep yourself, you know, together and then keep them safe. So if they're having a seizure and there's things around them, just move stuff so that they don't bang their head on the coffee table and, you know, keep them safe uh, while they're having a seizure. And I know it's hard to do because when my dog had my first dog, who Dr. Silver saw had a seizure, she's like, I want you to videotape it and time it. But instead, what I did was panic and go, and run around. but <laughs> that was my first couple of ones. But then I was yeah. able to videotape it and time it. And what we found out later for, for my first dog is that he was having seizures, but he was having one seizure every maybe four months. And, and once we determined that we were able to actually say, OK, we could live with this. They were short. They only came every he had like four seizures a year and we were able to live with that. But the videotaping and the timing was really important important information for you. Absolutely. I know one thing that, that I was doing wrong and uh, it was just an incidental mentioning in the conversation was my instinct was to pick Dagny up and hold her. And uh, I was told probably by you, Dr. Silver is, you know, keep her head down because you mentioned that hyper salivation and the frothing at the mouth. And so, you know, we didn't want her to like aspirate or choke on her saliva and you know and I was doing just the opposite I had her you know head up and was holding her next next to my chest so yeah and I think everyone's first impulse is to you know comfort the animal and so one thing you can do and especially you know because you always have to evaluate them too when they're coming out is are you there who are you um, do you know who I am because there are some dogs that are aggressive afterwards and you know I had, I had one dog and I, I sometimes I'm like it's funny not funny but um, I had one little um Boston Terrier years ago that after the seizure would like come flying after the owners and like chase them into the bathroom and they'd have to crawl out the bathroom window to get back into the house. Oh, um, so, and then some other dogs, if you have a large, like whether it's a Rottweiler, if you have a large dog that's strong and if they don't know who you are coming out, like they can be dangerous. And so one thing that can give you a little protection barrier is take a comforter, take a quilt, throw it over them like a burrito and then you can kind of lay on them. So you've got some of that almost like your uh, thunder shirt type of yeah. uh, approach, but you've got a protective barrier between them and you. So if they wake up, you've got something to kind of hold them down, but their face and their teeth aren't going to be in your face. So just to protect yourself until you, they're awake enough to understand it's their owner next to them. Again, in Dagny's case, because we have these options available to us, part of her yeah. workup was that you did a cerebral spinal fluid tap and MRI, I'm sure basic blood work, you know, to try to, again, eliminate any other possible causes and thus arrive at the diagnosis of idiopathic epilepsy. Yeah. Is that, I mean, can you just talk about kind of that workup sure. and, and if, Absolutely. 
Yep. So uh, if an animal comes in, so the first part is to determine we're all happy that, yep, that was a seizure. The second part is we go through, you know, the differential. So we can have idiopathic epilepsy, which if we do a full workup, we'll find nothing. And that's great. This other is going to be metabolic, so lab work. So we're going to recommend basic CBC profile, your analysis, just looking for, you know, any flags that there's something off. Usually in younger animals, all that stuff is normal, but it's a great baseline. So to me, that your lab work is a minimal database. And then if we want to go to the next step, it's looking at the brain. So it's evaluating that third category, so structural brain disease. So MRI. So an MRI is going to look at the anatomy of the brain to see is the animal born with a normal looking brain, anything congen congenitally abnormal. And it's going to look for any obvious signs of strokes, tumors. Basically, I, I say MRI is your eyeballs. And so, so it'd be like taking a brain out, slicing up on a plate and looking at it. It's not a microscope, it's my eyes. And so it's what my eyes can see with the MRI scan. If the MRI is normal, or sometimes if there's kind of a few areas that are abnormal, the next step we do before we wake them up is we do a spinal tap. So the best way that I can get as much information from a brain is A, look at it on the MR scan, and then B, grab some of the fluid that's surrounding the brain. So if all that stuff comes back normal, by default, you're an idiopathic epileptic, meaning your dog has seizures, we do not have an underlying cause, which is good. So if a client comes to me, um, as a neurologist, I'm always going to offer you the best. So I'm always going to offer you, you know, a full workup, which if I went in with a seizure or my child went in with a seizure, that's what I would want. The best thing that I could find is nothing. Now that workup is expensive. So depending on what part of the country you're in, you're probably going to spend anywhere from, you know, four to $6,000 for that workup. It's very expensive. Most insurances, but not all will cover that, which would be another topic um, that you guys should talk about at some point is the importance of having pet insurance. Access that folks have now to specialized care or veterinary care is tremendous, but it comes with a cost. And so getting pet insurance after the animal has a seizure would be great for everything except for the seizures. They'll not cover a pre-existing condition. So it's very expensive. So I'm always going to offer the best but then we also have to talk about the logistics or reality of whether the owner can afford that and whether they have to do that. So there's certainly some animals that come in that based on the history and the exam, you know, we can certainly have strong suspicions of epilepsy. And sometimes we can make some decisions based on how things go over time. So if an animal, if an owner can't afford a full workup, you know, that's a conversation to have and that they shouldn't feel bad about that. It's <clears throat> extremely best and again, or extremely uh, expensive. So I always say that I'm going to offer the best, but we can pare it down based on what that owner can do. And sometimes even when I'm concerned that there is structural brain disease going on, you know, I'll do my best, but the owner has to understand that I, I don't know what I'm treating when I don't have a workup. And so we do our best with medications, but it's hard to prognosticate or give them any idea of what's going to happen when I don't know the underlying cause of the seizures. So again, an open conversation and, and setting expectations. Are there certain things such as age that could help a veterinarian to kind of narrow down possibilities? So again, let's say they don't have access to a neurologist with an MRI and, you know, they do blood work and they do you know, an x-ray and what have you. But I guess what I'm thinking is I know one thing that was ruled out based on Dagny's age was a liver shunt, which is sure. a malformation of blood flow through the liver, I believe. Sure. And yeah. then I've had many clients based on the population that I treat that are elderly, you know, very geriatric, and maybe they've never had a seizure in their entire life. And then now they have a seizure. And then I think that oftentimes they're told it may be a tumor. Sure. Yep, you're absolutely right. So in general, um, with idiopathic epilepsy, it tends to be a young adult problem. So the bell curve is somewhere between two to four years of age. So if uh, an animal has new onset seizures and they're younger than one, it doesn't mean it can't be epilepsy, but we do start wondering about congenital issues, whether it's a brain malformation or the shunt that you had talked about. And same thing, if they're older than five with new onset seizures, we start wondering if they're getting old enough that something has happened uh, in the brain. Now, having said that, I always say we follow rules. The animals don't always follow the rules we follow. And so certainly I have 
done complete workups on geriatric animals and have come back and said late onset epilepsy, which is fantastic. But we do worry the older they are that there's probably an underlying cause of that. But again, on occasion, we will find late onset epilepsy. Um, and then the vice versa part is that you got to be a little careful about being too presumptive or nonchalant about a two or three year old animal because, you know, encephalitis tends to be a young adult onset as well. But the one thing I will say is, is the truth will out itself in time. And so if we start with having, you know, seizures, you know, in August of 2022, and we're still kind of meeting, you know, 23, 24 and animal seizures are fairly well controlled and otherwise they're normal in time, we can make some um, best guesses. So it's hard on that first seizure because we're just getting going. But with epilepsy in general, there's going to be no progression of other signs. And so structural brain disease, metabolic disease, there's going to be other signs at some point. So if the dog has new onset seizures um, and it's from a brain tumor, often the first clinical sign is the seizure. But in time, other things like pacing, circling, mentation changes, standing in corners, other things are going to happen in time if that seizure is from a brain tumor. You know, Chris, as we're talking with Dr. Silver about seizures, one of the things that comes to mind is the Dog Health Journal that our friend Erin, the dog mom, uh, created. And we just did a podcast just not that long ago, called the Dog Health Journal with Aaron the Dog Mom. Absolutely. And you know what? We we just published that podcast with Aaron the Dog Mom about the Dog Health Journal. So go there and uh, look it up. We have a YouTube where Aaron does a little show and tell, but yeah, great tool. And I think it would be perfect for a dog with seizure disorder because I wish I had that when when I had my Dagny. I mean, there was always tracking of things, whether it was meds, supplements, how many seizures she had, when did they occur, how long did they last, were there any triggers, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all there in one place. And I, like I said, wish I would have had the Dog Health Journal at the time. Yeah, it's a great tool. Check out our podcast with Erin, the Dog Mom. So as we're wrapping up here, I have, I have a, a question that I wanted to get in. I saw in my research of this topic that there are a gazillion products online, quote unquote, natural remedies to help with seizures, CBD products and so forth. Is there any validity to those? I guess to address the CBD. So in humans, um, there certainly is, are studies and they do use CBD for epilepsy in children. What I have found in veterinary medicine is I'll often say, CBD is not new. It's just really popular. And I, I almost feel like it was more popular five years ago. As far as what I have seen, I have certainly had clients come in on CBD. They added in for the seizures. The way I look at it is I say, it's not going to hurt. Uh, so there's no harm, no foul. Um, just don't mess with the drugs I'm putting you on. Um, if I look back, honestly, five years, 10 years, the number of clients that have stayed on CBD for their seizures is less than 5%. So over time, they end up coming off of it. So there are some studies in veterinary medicine with, with um, CBD and seizures. I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we know dosing. And I also got to be a little careful about quality control because it's, you know, there's no FDA approved products. Um, and again, the you never know what you're getting. So the, the quality control is not there. So not going to hurt if I thought it was a panacea and it was making a huge difference. I would sell it at our clinic. I don't. Yeah. So yeah. I tell folks, you're more than welcome to try it. Um, you know, I'm, it's not something I'm going to guide you with or tell you where to go because I don't believe it makes a huge difference. The other thing um, to kind of bring in there that I get on occasion is uh, the brain diet and so or, or dietary changes. So Perina had put out uh, a brain diet to help with epilepsy or anything neuro, and it is, it's based on the ketogenic diet. But if you look at the research that they did to support that, you know, it's, it's off of a very low amount of dogs over a six month period. And if you talk to anyone who's lived their life with a dog with epilepsy, they'll tell you that you can't determine much in a six month period. So I'm not convinced um, that that study was supportive, that a BD or ketogenic diet is going to be helpful for dogs. It's expensive. So again, if you ask me at my hospital, do we sell BD? We do not. Uh, if a client wants to, you know, use it, that's fine. Just don't mess with my drugs. Um, most people again stop paying for it. It's expensive. So most clients that have tried it, I feel have come off of it. So 
Have I yet to find a client that said this this was what changed everything for them? I have not. You know, again, your dog seizures are your dog seizures. So everyone's going to have their, you know, some clients have their story. So I did have one dog. You know what? Barometric pressure was tough on that dog. That dog in the summertime during thunderstorm season, when I first met this client who ended up being a f- fantastic client, we enjoyed her thoroughly. But when she first told me that, I'm like, you're crazy. <laughs> As I got to know her and her dog, she was spot on. So the client knows their animal. So if they tell me, like often they'll say, when this happens, this is causes seizures. And I'll say to them nine times out of 10. And if they're like, well, no, he does that all the time anyway. And he has a seizure. It doesn't count. So it's got to be like nine times out of 10. If A happens, he has a seizure. Then, then you're on to something. But otherwise, it's just speculation. But again, you write it down. I guess the other thing that I would say is just with some of the flea tick products that I do get a lot of questions. Um, so certainly the fine print with those products is they can cause neurological problems, including seizures. Um, and so the problem is we all use that, right? So tick-borne disease is pretty prevalent. Um, and so most of us have our animals on a monthly flea and tick product. If your dog had never been had seizures. If your dog had never been on the product and you newly introduced it and had a seizure, again, I think that you need to pay attention to that. If your dog has been on the same product for a year, two years, and now we have seizures, it's not the product. Or if your dog's had seizures and then all of a sudden, you know, you're now using the product and he has a seizure, it's not the product. So again, it's that you kind of have to look at the big picture and just a little bit of common sense on there. But I have a lot of clients that come in that refuse to use any flea and tick products. Um, And again, it's personal preference, but boy, we certainly do have a lot of tick-borne disease in this area that can cause some nasty diseases. So it's it's not a blanket statement for me that, you know, those products cause seizures come off of it. I look at the individual case and see if it makes sense in that. Majority of the dogs that I see, it's not from the flea and tick products. So Dr. Silver, thank you so much. Once again, third time's a charm for... um, coming on to our show. We've hit your big three and we really, really appreciate it. Once again, can you let our audience know where to find you and perhaps maybe where to get some good information about seizures? Yeah. And so we're at the, um, we're in Woburn, Massachusetts, um, Massachusetts Veterinary Referral Hospital. Been there for 23 years. So we are, uh, it's a Six day a week appointment service. So I have two colleagues, Dr. Troxel and Dr. Riggs, that works with me. And we're fortunate enough to have two neuro interns. So between the five of us, there is somebody there for appointments six days a week uh, with an intern and uh, emergency backup on Sundays. So there's always somebody there. It doesn't take too long to get into appointments. So it's not backed up by week. So if you call today, you can probably get an appointment within the, with sometimes the same day, but over, you know, within the week, you can get in to see us. Just again, do you- is there, are there resources? Is there a place for a pet owner to uh, do some research or should they just simply go to their vet because this can be all over the place in terms of seizures? Yeah, I think there's there's always online. And I think even I've actually just finished up doing some uh, videos on the three diseases that we've talked about here. And I'll, there will be some awesome. videos available on our website coming up shortly. But there's lots of information on the internet. What I would tell people is look at who wrote it. So there's lots of uh, stuff out there by written by neurologists. That's going to be your best bet. Or if you go to, you know, specialty referral hospitals that have neurologists, a lot of times that there's some information on their website about uh, neurological diseases that we see. So your best source. So you know, Joe's friend, sister's aunt who has a dog, that's not your best source. So um, consider your sources. If it's written by a veterinary neurologist, you're in good shape. Dr. Silver, thank you for joining us. You are a wealth of information and uh, we always enjoy talking with you. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us. It's always a pleasure. I feel like we're sitting down having a coffee and just chit-chatting. I think it's right. fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on social media at Petability Podcast. And please check out our affiliates and sponsors. Simply go to the show notes for information and links. Thank you and tune in next time.